Isn't it great to be here at the Eucharistic Congress? So many times in our lives, we form an opinion. We think about something, and immediately it goes into our head, and we've got an opinion, and that opinion becomes almost unshakable. But that's not how it should always be. I want you to think about the theme for this Eucharistic Congress, that they all may be made one, that they all may be one. What comes into your mind? And just hold that image for a few minutes. Because when we have these thoughts and they pop into our head, sometimes something will happen that will shed new light on the topic and make us think differently. And I hope to do that for you today. But let me give you an example. There was a man and a woman who had a wonderful day together. They'd been married for 40 years, and they had a great Saturday, very relaxing, and they enjoyed the entire day. And in the late part of the day, they stepped out on their back porch to enjoy a glass of wine. And they were sitting there looking wistfully off into the sunset. And the woman stared out and said, I love you so much. I don't know what I'd ever do without you. And her husband had never heard her spoke, speak like that ever. And he looked at her and he said, honey, is that you speaking or the wine? And she said, oh dear, it is me speaking to the wine. <laughs> and he suddenly saw things in a different light. As Leno said, a few years ago, I had the opportunity to travel with CRS and visit Serbia and Greece and meet with a lot of refugees that were coming across from Syria, Afghanistan, and Iraq. And our impression, oftentimes, when we hear the refugee, uh, refugee is that it's somebody that's really poor, someone who doesn't have much hope in life. They don't have much direction, and so they end up as refugees. But there's a long history of refugees. And if we look at our own faith, we hear of the Holy Family that were refugees. In the Gospel of Matthew, Joseph is told to rise and take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and stay there. I've often reflected on what that must have been like. Our Blessed Mother was probably 15 or 16 years old. Joseph was probably an old man of 27, 28. And yet they were going to Egypt, a place where they did not know the language, where there was no certainty Joseph could find work. They didn't know the culture, they didn't know the people, and they had this tiny baby. How frightening that had to have been for the Holy Family. They weren't the first refugees in the world, and they're not the last refugees in the world. The challenge of refugees has gone on for 20 centuries. This is a picture of Dadaab in Kenya. It's a refugee camp that houses 245,000 people. The average refugee in the world spends 17 years of their life in a camp just like this. This is the second largest refugee camp in the world. The largest is in Bangladesh. It houses one million refugees, mostly Rohingya, who've been chased from their land by violence and persecution. And I think that's a key for us to understand, that the definition of a refugee is someone who is fleeing because of violence or persecution. It's not someone trying to take advantage of economic opportunity. It's someone who is persecuted for their faith, for their culture, for who they are as a person. And they're caused to flee their homeland for their own safety. Today in the world, there are 22.5 million people that are refugees, 65.6 .6 million people who've been displaced from their homes internally in their country or to other countries. It's a shocking number when we think of 22 million of God's children who've been thrown out of their homes, living in cultures that they're not familiar with, among people that are not similar to them. Where do these folks go? Today, 56% are in Africa and North Africa, 17% in Europe, 16% in the Americas, 
that's North and South America, and 11 percent in Asia Pacific. Of the refugees that have fleed for safety, the vast majority, the largest portion, have found refuge in Turkey, in Pakistan, Lebanon, and Iran, the countries that are close to where they live. These are people that are running for their lives. Syria is a particular problem. Most of the refugees that I met in Greece and Afghanistan, in Greece and Serbia, were from Syria. And the problem is, in Syria, on the western coast, is where most people live. On that western border, that's where all the people live. To the east is mostly oil wells. People don't live out there. But you can see from this graphic where the warring factions are. The battle takes place from Damascus through Homs up to Aleppo. And this is an idea of what it looked like in 2018. There was much more fighting simply a year ago when ISIS had a stronger presence within the country. So people are fleeing their homes for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's extremely dangerous. Secondly, many of the cities no longer are inhabitable. There's no water. There's no electricity. There's no gas. There are no food stores. They can't live there anymore. They have to leave. And when they leave, they leave primarily because of the dangers. This is a picture of Amran Dakanesh. Amran was a little boy that lived in Aleppo. He's five years old. And in the airstrike that wounded Amran, his brother was killed. The house he lived in collapsed after the air, airstrike. And so he found himself not only injured, but homeless. And he and his family ultimately left Syria and sought protection in Turkey. When you think about staying in a place like Aleppo, where war is going on constantly, you have to be aware of the risks of staying, but also the risks of leaving. This little boy, Alan Curdy, the picture on, the, on your right, my left, is when he was two. Then in July of 2015, the picture was taken of him as a precocious little three-year-old, as cute as he can be. But his family decided they had to flee Syria. The war was too much. They didn't want their child killed. They didn't want injury to their family. And they decided to move on. This is the next picture that we saw of Alan Curdy. In September of 2015, this sprung to our screens with the international media showing us the tragedy and the risks of fleeing, as well as Omran with the risks of staying. Little Alan Curdy was killed in the Mediterranean. He drowned the night of September 2nd, 2015, with his mother, his brother. His father was the only survivor. They were crammed into a five-meter dinghy intended to hold eight people, but there were 16 people in it with no life vests. They would risk everything to get away from the destruction and war that was in their homeland. So this is what we saw in 2015. But at the same time, we were hearing in the national media and among a large number of politicians that the refugee crisis really was not a crisis at all. They were merely terrorists that were intent on infiltrating the West, and we really shouldn't pay attention. I work with Catholic Relief Services. I've been a global fellow there for eight years, and I love the work that we do. And so we were asked, as the International Humanitarian Aid Agency of the Roman Catholic Church in the United States, to send a small delegation to Greece and Serbia and find out what's really going on. Now, CRS is how you and I reach out to people overseas. We use St. Vincent de Paul in our parish communities and Catholic charities in the United States. But how you and I as church reach out to people overseas is through Catholic Relief Services. So two priests, six deacons, and two staff members with CRS departed and we went to Greece 
And there we are. Father Ron Schokel in the middle, you can't miss him. And we took off and landed in Athens to really see what was happening on the ground. We had an opportunity to see the refugees and talk to them. We had an opportunity to see the good work that was being done in your name on their behalf. And what we found was amazing. We're at the port of Pyrus, which is in Athens. It's the main port. Refugees would come up through Turkey, make it to the Turkish border, and then risk everything to cross the Mediterranean to Lesbos Island. And from there, the Greek government would put them on ferries and bring them into the harbor first thing in the morning. It was a cold morning in January, 24 degrees, with a howling wind, and we saw a ferry unload. 4,000 people. 4,000 people standing there, masses of people wandering around. They've arrived in Athens with no idea of where they're going to go, what are they going to do? They have no idea how to apply for asylum, how to move north. They just arrived. They've arrived in Europe, a place of safety. This is what we saw mostly. Men, women, and children. The man with the big plastic bag I spoke with briefly, and the bag was stuffed with clothing and jackets. And I said, do you have all of your possessions, your most valuable things in that bag? And he looked at me and he said, no, my most valuable possession is standing here at my side. His little boy. His wife had been killed in an airstrike, and he was setting out with his child to find safety within Europe. The mother with her two children were waiting for her husband to get some more information about how to make them their way north. And the young man with his little baby, the little cute baby with the red hat, was trying to, to get a few more gloves for his child. His child arrived without shoes, and we were able to provide shoes because there at the port, as the refugees got off the boat, what we're doing, what you're doing, is providing food, direction, clothing, shoes, hats, gloves, diapers, things that people couldn't travel with when they left their home in the middle of the night because of an airstrike. We saw very few women traveling alone. It's far too dangerous. It's not dangerous because of what will happen when they get to the host countries, when they arrive in Greece or Serbia or Macedonia. It's not too dangerous because of the people they're traveling with. But it's dangerous oftentimes because of the authorities. Refugees were warned not to travel through Bulgaria because the police were notorious for taking their money and raping the women. So they avoided Bulgaria at all costs. So we didn't see many women along the way. This is the little boy that had the red hat on. He said his ears were cold. They found a bear hat for him. And I love the look on his father's face, a look of joy that you brought to him as he went on his way. At the end of this long collection of clothing they picked up were these orange bags. And I was trying to help out. You know, I'm a deacon, I'm supposed to be a servant, and I'm supposed to help out. And I walked down there, and I started handing out these orange bags because people were coming by, and each one was supposed to get an orange bag as far as I, as far as I was concerned. And as I was handing them out, a nice little Greek lady came over, and she said, the men do not get orange bags. What's wrong with men getting orange bags? And I said, that, that's not fair. The men should get orange bags. And she said, the men do not get orange bags. And I said, why not? And she said two words, women's hygiene. <laughs> and I said, oh, oh, <laughs> the men do not get orange bags. <laughs> I've shared with you a few statistics, and Pope Francis tells us that we're not about statistics, we're about families, we're about human beings, the dignity of each person. 
And what he encourages us to do is measure the refugees, not in numbers, but in names and stories and families. And I want to share a couple of stories with you. And these are people that I met and were impressed with. I met a woman at a safe house, a safe hotel actually, in Athens. And the, the safe house was purchased by Caritas Switzerland for the express purpose of allowing refugees to live there. And the woman's name was Hyatt, H-I-A-T, Hyatt. And she had six children. Hyatt lived in a small city called Hama. And Hama is about halfway between Damascus and Aleppo. And you can see from this graphic that she lived in this blue area, which is controlled by Assad's forces, but it's very near where the rebel forces are in gold. A few years ago, the line of demarcation between the Assad forces and the rebel forces was her city. And a few years ago, her husband, who was an accountant, was coming home from work, and he turned down a street, a normal street he always would come home on his way, and a battle broke out between the Assad forces and the rebel forces, and he was killed. Now, when I talked to Hyatt, I asked her what her life was like before the war. She said, I have six kids. My, my oldest now is 12. And he and his brothers took piano. They played soccer. I drove a Toyota minivan. I helped my kids study when they came home. I cared for the little ones, and my husband provided for us. And as she said that, it occurred to me, she was like my wife. She's a soccer mom. She just loves her children. Piano lessons, soccer, the same thing that American families do. Well, as we talked, she told me about her three boys that were sitting there, Mustafa, Mohammed, and Adnan. Mohammed was the oldest. He's a 12-year-old. Adnan is 10, and their younger brother is now eight. But at the time their father died two years ago, she had another son at home, an eight-year-old. And when Hyatt's husband was killed, she decided she would seek asylum in Germany. Chancellor Merkel's government was allowing lots of refugees in. And she had a simple rule that if one member of the family could make it to Germany and receive asylum, the rest of the immediate family could come. They didn't have to apply. They could just show up. She had a brother-in-law, her dead husband's brother, who lived in Munich. But that didn't count. It has to be a member of the immediate family. And she wanted to migrate to Munich to be with some family members, with someone who's gone before. But she had a challenge. She had this young family. She had a newborn baby at home. At that time, Muhammad, the oldest, was 10. She needed the older children to stay with her to help with the youngest. So she made a decision that I can't believe she had to make. She sent her eight-year-old to Munich alone. She entrusted her eight-year-old son to the care of a stranger, hoping that he would get across Turkey make it across the Mediterranean to Greece and get to safety in Athens where his uncle could pick him up. She kissed her son goodbye and heard nothing for three months. Three months later, she discovered he was there. But during those agonizing three months, she didn't know if her son was alive, if he had died. Did he drown in the, in the Mediterranean Sea? Was he killed by terrorists? She had no idea. So as I talked to Hyatt, she was exhausted. She was grateful to be in Greece, and she couldn't wait to see her, new, her son in Germany, but she had with her five children. And she said to me, this is not the life I ever intended. It's not the life my husband and I wanted for our children, and I don't know why it's happening to me. And she said, Deacon, my children haven't lived yet. Why should they die? Why should your children die? Why should any children die? And I told her, Hyatt, nobody's children should die this way. This is not the world that we should live in. 
And what we're doing for her, you and I, is providing a path for Hyatt and her children to get to safety, to be with her brother-in-law. And she struggled that whole journey. And I pray she made it. She didn't have an email address. She didn't have a cell phone. I'll never know if she made it. But I pray every day that she did. After we met Hyatt, we went to a transit point on the Serbian-Croatia border. And this was a place where refugees would get off of a bus and then get onto a train a day or so later. And we met this wonderful worker. She was just the most incredible young woman. And her job was to blow bubbles for children. Now, we've, we've all seen this, but she said these kids have never seen soap bubbles. And she was dipping the wand in and waving them around, and the kids were going crazy, jumping up and down. And I said, what a great job. Have, how long have you done this? And she said, for about a year. And I said, that's amazing. What's your job title? And she said, I don't know. They call me Bubbles. And I said, do you get paid a lot? And she said, well, we don't get paid much, but I haven't had to buy any shampoo in about a year. <laughs> there are lots of young folks that are there. Along the path the refugees are taking, I saw kids as young as 16, but mostly 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds working with the refugees. Now, there are some people like me in our 60s that were out there too, but lots and lots of kids. There was an evangelical church from Dallas that sent 10 kids over. Their job at this transit station was to pick up trash. I've never seen happier trash people in my life. They were overjoyed, but they're overjoyed with the service of other people, bringing Christ through service to people in need. It was absolutely beautiful. Then I met a wonderful man named Ahmad Ferris. That's his son, Karam. And when I first met them, they were just outside of a clinic that's run by Doctors Without Borders. So I sat down with Ahmad, and I said the same thing most Americans do when we meet someone, we're not sure they speak our language. I said, do you speak English? And he said, I do. I speak English, Farsi, Arabic, and French. What do you speak? English. <laughs> Ahmad was from Aleppo. Ahmad lived where some of the most serious battles have taken place. Aleppo was a triangle of three forces, the Assad regime, the rebels, and ISIS, all in the same city. I asked him about his life prior to the war. He had a master's and PhD in engineering. He lived with his wife and three children in Aleppo. He was a professor at the University of Aleppo as well as an engineer that worked both in the private sector as well as the public sector. He told me in Syria he was rich, but it's all been taken away. He's on the run now. And he was in this clinic with Karam because Karam wasn't well. As it turned out, Karam had the flu. So we went into the clinic. And it's run by Doctors Without Borders, but entirely supplied by Catholic Relief Services by you, providing the necessary medical equipment that they need to survive. And so little Karam was treated. When I asked Ahmad the circumstances surrounding his flight from Aleppo, he told me that he was at, mar he was at work one day and his wife was at market with their three children when their house was destroyed by a bomb. Now, I'm not a very smart person. I said, who bombed it? Was it the Russians, the Americans, the Syrians? And he said, does it matter? My home was destroyed. The reason his children were with his wife is the school system in Aleppo had closed three years earlier. And they were homeschooling their children as best they possibly could, trying to give them something of an education. After their house was destroyed, he moved in with his brother, and his brother's house was severely damaged in another attack. They moved to the far outskirts of Aleppo, but then discovered that there were raging gun battles every night. And it was at that point Ahmad made the decision to take his wife to, and children to safety. His hope was to get to France, because he spoke French, and so did his wife, and so did Haram. And he could get there and get a job. 
So I asked, are you going to be a French citizen from now on? Is that what you want? And he looked at me with astonishment, and he said, no man wants to live outside of his own country. I'm a Syrian, and when peace comes, I shall go back to Syria. I'm an engineer. I'll rebuild my country. He was determined to go back. My brothers and sisters, 11 million Syrians have been displaced due to the civil war there. 11 million Syrians. We are called by the Eucharist to commit ourselves to the poor. And by committing ourselves to the poor means we must act. Because belief without action is opinion. If we believe something, we act on it. We can't just be bystanders. And the Eucharist calls us to that. St. John Chrysostom said this, to receive the body and blood of Christ given up for us, we must recognize Christ in the poorest. You have tasted the blood of the Lord. If you do not recognize the poor, brother, you dishonor the Lord's table. So what model can we follow to not dishonor the Lord's tailor, table, to allow the Eucharist to inspire us to action? What model in Scripture is better than that of the Good Samaritan? Now, there's lots of ways to think about the parable of the Good Samaritan, but there's a feature of it we often don't really think about. And that is, when Jesus said, a man went from Jerusalem down to Jericho, he was stripped and beaten by robbers. Jesus chose his words carefully. Why did he say the man was stripped? It was to show he had no identity. They couldn't tell if he was a rich man, if he was a poor man, if he was Jew, Gentile. Jesus took away his identity to inspire the hearers of the story to help everyone. And then St. Luke gives us this wonderful feature that he has in so many of his parables. He leaves an unnamed character. In the parable of the Good Samaritan, we have the Samaritan, we've got an innkeeper, we've got a couple of robbers, we've got a priest, we've got a Levite. And Jesus tells us, plug yourself in, but you can't have any of those roles. The only one left is the man laying in the dust. What Jesus wants us to see is we're the one in the dust. Now, if we had been beaten and stripped and left half dead, who would you take help from? Anybody! <laughs> and my brothers and sisters, if we'll take help from anybody, we're called to help everybody. That's the message of the, good, the parable of the Good Samaritan. And so as we do that, we have to ask ourselves, how well are we doing that? How well are you and I being a Good Samaritan today to the refugees? There are 11 million people who are displaced in Syria. Six and one-half million Syrians no longer live in their country, a country that 15 years ago boasted a population of 20 million. A quarter of their population is gone. Are we priests? Levites that just walk by, or are we the Samaritan? So I want to ask you, brothers and sisters, how many Syrian refugees have we taken into our country in 2018? Does anyone have a guess? It's more than zero. Shout it out. One six. That's really close. The most powerful country in the world, we have taken in 11 Syrians. That means we would not take in Hyatt and Ahmad and their families, because that's 12. So we are called to, to be in solidarity with these people who are our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are called to action. The Eucharist demands that we act. So what do we do? Well, the first thing we have to do is recognize that the model for us is not the Good Samaritan. The model is Jesus Christ himself. 
Jesus used the, the image of the Good Samaritan as an image of Himself, the person that will always be helping, the person that's always reaching out, and that's who we're called to be. So what actions do we take if we're going to act? We have to pray. We have to pray for the refugees, these people who, by circumstance of their birth, are running for their lives. We have to learn. We have to go to real news sources. You can go to the Catholic Relief Services website, crs.org. You can go to the United Nations Commissioner, Commissioner for High, uh, High Commissioner for Refugees. Go to that website and get the truth about how many people are fleeing for their lives and where they're going and where they came from. And sadly, how many have died in the Mediterranean? This year, 2,600 people so far have drowned in the Mediterranean trying to flee their homeland. So we can find real new sources. And then we have to act. We have to advocate and be a voice for people who are voiceless. The Eucharist demands that we act. So we need to speak to people in power and tell them that we are a brave and courageous people, but we're a compassionate people. And we're willing to have Hyatt and her children and Ahmad and his family in our midst because they'll bring to our society and to our communities something greater than we have today. And we can give. We can give of ourselves and our time. We can give of our talent and we can give of our, of our financial resources. Because the people that are running have no access to funds. They don't have bank accounts anymore. They don't have checkbooks. They're entirely dependent upon the generosity of strangers. They are truly the, the person laying in the dust waiting for the Good Samaritan to come along. And that's our job. In his first trip outside of Rome after elected, being elected Pope, Pope Francis went to a, a small island in Italy called Lampedusa. It was the first time he had left Rome. And Lampedusa is a place where many refugees are landing. But Lampedusa has a very rocky shore. And many of the boats coming to Lampedusa crash on the rocks. And they're shattered. For the boats that sink, about half the people drown, about half the people are saved. But yet they still come. And when he arrived in Lampedusa, a local carpenter there made this cross for our Holy Father. And that cross was made out of the shards of boats that had crashed on the rocks. And Pope Francis said it was a reminder to him of the reason we have to reach out to the refugees and the reason we as church must open our doors for them. He asked that every parish community throughout the world take in one refugee family. And some parishes here in the Archdiocese of Atlanta have done that. But that reminder is an important thing for us. A year and a half ago, a dear friend of mine gave me this cross. It's a Lampedusa cross. This wood was once on a boat that refugees sailed to Lampedusa on looking for safety and looking for peace. I can't tell you how much this means to me. It's more valuable than any other possession I have. And I keep it on my desk to remind me every day that I'm responsible for helping save the refugees, that I have a duty, that the Eucharist commits me to helping them. I, I don't have a day off that I can just ignore thinking or praying for the safety of the ref refugees. I don't have a day off that I can just say, well, it doesn't matter today. This cross reminds me of what they're going through. And I think we all need those reminders. We all need a reminder that we have to do something every single day for the poorest of the poor in the world. And so some of the most desperate are refugees. So what do we do? I think our best reminder comes from the Gospel of Matthew. We've all heard it a million times. 
And a priest friend of mine said this, and I think it's great. He said, when we die and we face the Lord, He's not going to say, how many rosaries did you pray? He's not going to say, how many masses did you attend? He's not going to say, how many novenas did you do? He's going to ask you a question that is your test. It is your test for eternal salvation, and you got to get the answer right. But the really good news is, He gave us the answer. All we've got to do is live it. Jesus told us our very salvation depends on our response to human need. Nothing more, nothing less. That doesn't mean the Mass is not important. Don't, don't go run into Archbishop Gregory today and saying, Deacon Steve said we don't have to come to Mass. We're strengthened in that vocation of helping others in the Mass. We're strengthened in prayer by the Rosary. We're strengthened in prayer in all of our spiritual activities to do the good work of Christ on earth. And helping the poor is that good work. And if we do it, our salvation is assured. Isn't that great? He gives you the test and then gives you the answer. What a great Lord. Again, I want you to think again about the theme of this Eucharistic Congress, that they all may be one. And when you thought about that at the beginning of my talk, and I asked you to think about it, did you think about reunification of all the Christian churches? If you did, we need to see that in a new light. When Jesus said that, He wants us to be one with everyone. We live in solidarity with every single person on this planet. Every one of us is created in the likeness and image of God. And we share the same human dignity, regardless of our economic circumstances, our emotional circumstances, our physical abilities, our wealth or poverty. They're all our brothers and sisters. That's what it means to be one, one human family. I said that we should pray, and we should pray for the refugees. And I'd like to do just that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Loving Father, in your infinite compassion, we seek your divine protection for refugees who are often alone and afraid. Provide solace to those who have witnessed violence and destruction who have lost family, friends, home, and all they cherish due to war or persecution. Comfort them in their sorrow. Bring help in their time of need. Show your compassionate mercy to all unaccompanied children. Reunite them with their families and their loved ones. Guide those children who are strangers in a foreign land to a place of great peace and safety. Comfort them in their sorrow and bring us help and bring them help in their time of need. Show us how we may reach out to these precious and vulnerable children of yours. Open our hearts to all migrants and refugees in need, so that we might see in them your own migrant son, our Lord Jesus. Strengthen us with the courage to stand up in their defense against all those who would do them harm. For we pray this through our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. May God bless you all.